Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the February Citizens Climate Lobby call. My name is Mark Reynolds. I'm a member of the CCL staff, and I'm hosting today's call. What's going to happen is just in a couple of minutes, we'll be introducing our guest, Diane Randall, who I'm very pleased that all of you get a chance to meet. Uh, after that, um, I'll be reading a short tribute to Secretary of State Schultz, who was one of our early board members and a, uh, an important part of this organization. Uh, after that, um, I want to go over a few things that happened since last month's call, uh, talk about what we're asking you to do. And then the last thing that'll happen today is there is a recorded uh, message from Senator Kuhn. So a lot's gonna be happening today and we're, we're looking forward to that. I asked Jamie DeMarco, uh, who's one of the best people I've ever worked with, who was also a fellow Quaker, if he would introduce our guest, uh, Diane Randall today. So Jamie, could you unmute your line and please introduce our guest? Of course, thank you, Mark. If there was ever a prophetic witness on the Hill, it is Diane Randall, who is the General Secretary of the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Friends is another word for Quaker, and General Secretary is another word for Executive Director. So she runs the federal Quaker lobby. And Diane's spiritual grounding is ever present in her lobbying. Often when she speaks, I honestly feel the way I do when I'm watching rays of sun break out between clouds or something beautiful like that, even when she's talking about technical legislative policy. And I have the unique honor of having worked for both the Citizens Climate Lobby and the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And I can tell you that if you have ever found yourself saying, I wish there was a Citizens Climate Lobby, but for every issue, then the Friends Committee on National Legislation is the group you've been looking for. And you don't have to be a Quaker to volunteer. Under Diane's leadership, FCNL has done incredible things. After years of work, they succeeded in getting Mitch McConnell to pass criminal justice reform legislation into law. And for years, they quietly built uh, bipartisan support for ending U.S. support for the war in Yemen, which laid the groundwork for Biden to finally halt that support when he took office. Between now and the August recess, we are likely to see the sweeping national climate legislation pass in Congress a moment we have been waiting for for years, many of us decades. In those critical months, I think there is no one I would rather have as an ally than Diane Randall and the Quakers that she so effectively leads. Diane, take it away. Jamie, thank you for that very gracious uh, uh, introduction. Um, and Mark, thank you for the invitation and great to be with you. Um, it's just great to even watch how you put this webinar together, your efficiency, the great uh, role that you had at the beginning that, that just hits so many highlights. Um, so I'm gonna do three things. Uh, and Mark, you just feel free to, or Jamie, jump in to either ask questions or, or uh, you know, give me a time signal. Um, I wanna talk, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about, more about myself, just so you know where I'm coming from. I wanna talk about FCNL. I wanna talk a little bit about our theory of change because it aligns really quite well with Citizens Climate Lobby. And then I want to talk just a little bit about what we're doing on, on the climate change issue. Um, so uh, I just want to give a shout out to my uh, friends out in Nebraska. I was uh, actually born in Iowa, but grew up in Nebraska, lived in Omaha for my entire life, a uh, young adult life, I should say, until I was a young adult. Then I moved to Connecticut. Um, and I also note that we have some friends from Minnesota. I've got family in Minnesota, and I know you're in a deep freeze this weekend. So thinking of all of you. Um, I got my start. Uh, I actually was not very politically active when I was young and I got started working with the nuclear freeze campaign back in the 1980s, which really was a grassroots movement to, to address a global imperative, to address the existential threat of nuclear weapons, which at that time were just growing exponentially between the USSR, then USSR and the United States. And so this was a, a citizen's movement to simply freeze the production of nuclear weapons. But it was that start that connected me to um, both people of faith, uh, significantly people uh, in the Roman Catholic Church who were social justice advocates, um, as well as it was when I first learned about FCNL and that was before I was a Quaker. Um, so I had been teaching school. I was actually an English teacher, left uh, my teaching position to go work um, I might say at a, a, a very low wage for this little scrappy nonprofit in Omaha, Nebraska, and found myself um, sometimes on a debate stage with a commander from the Strategic Air Command because they were controlling nuclear weapons. Now, the reason I tell you this story is because 
I was not an expert. I learned, I learned enough to say um, why it was that I opposed the further production of nuclear weapons and enough to have a discourse in front of an audience. But I told my story and my story was about uh, believing that we shouldn't be trying to destroy the world. It's really the story that many of you are telling about climate change. Um, it was also, I had had my first child and I was very compelled as a mom to, to want to do this work. So that's how I got started. Fast forward, um, I've been at a Friends Committee on National Legislation for about 10 years. And as Jamie described, um, we are a Quaker organization. We are based in Washington, DC with a staff of about 50. Um, but we really work with people all across the country. And, and that's one of the ways that we are like Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, our issues are set by Quakers. We go through a process where we ask Quakers who are involved in Quaker meetings and churches what they believe our priorities should be. Significantly those, and historically, uh, FCNL has been around since 1943, have been to work on peace, uh, consistently opposing nuclear weapons, working for disarmament and nuclear non-proliferation, but also instigating a peace building program. Uh, as Jamie mentioned, we've been working to try to end US support for the Saudi Arabia war, Saudi Arabia's uh, war in Yemen. And, uh, and there's a whole range of issues that we've worked on over those years. But we also have a very avid domestic policy program and we put our climate change work in the, the domestic program, although realistically, as you all know, this is not a domestic pro problem alone. It's an international challenge for all of us. Um, but we work, on, we work on that. We work on uh, criminal justice reform, uh, mass incarceration, election integrity, economic justice, um, and Native American issues as well. So it's a wide range of issues that we work on. And that gets a little bit to my point about how FCNL does its work. Um, when I arrived, I had been actually doing advocacy work uh, in Connecticut on affordable housing and homelessness. And I wondered out loud about how could you cover that many issues? And the way we do it is that we have a issue area expertise, the lobbyists who work on the specific program, the case of our climate change work, that is Clarence Edwards. And each of our lobbyists has a program assistant, a young fellow is what we call them. And that's how Jamie came to work with us, which was, he was terrific. Um, uh, so we each have, a, they each have basically two people who are carrying that load, but we have, um, uh, the, the thing that's fascinating to me is that there is a real intersection uh, on all these issues, as you all know. Um, climate change is related to migration. It is related to the refugee crisis. Uh, climate change is related to war in the sense that, you know, the destruction and the, that goes on is, is ruining our earth. And, um, and just the creation of weapons is also causing great harm environmentally. Um, but it's also re related to Native American issues. And so um, we, we see those intersectional ways that the issues relate. But the fact is we focus on Congress and so much of our work is focused on uh, lobbying Congress. And as you know, Congress tends to be work somewhat in silos. And so a lot of what we lobby on is in a similar fashion, setting a priority for the influencers in Congress on a specific piece of legislation and building a strategy around that, but knowing that it is essential to get to every single member of Congress. And that's um, one of the things that we share with you. And one of the ways that I think of uh, Citizens Climate Lobby as being so extraordinarily powerful that you are uh, all across the country. Um, I didn't ask Mark this, but I imagine you're probably in 435 congressional districts and certainly in all 50 states then, and that you're able to talk to every single member. And that we know works. Uh, you know it, you've been doing it for a long time, but I just wanna affirm it makes a difference. And my guess is that when you have your communicator calls or you all to get together, you can tell stories about where change has happened. Uh, we can do that and we, we did it. We had a constituent up in um, Pennsylvania who worked on then uh, Representative Ryan Costello and he was a Republican from that district and just kept talking to him all the time for like three years. and. She finally, he, he, he was disposed, but he finally moved a bit, you know, on, on the issue around climate change. And she then said to him, you know, I voted for you. I voted for you because you were willing to move. And she had never voted for a Republican before. But we know that this is not just a Democrat 
and it's not just a Republican issue. This does require us to be bipartisan. Um, I love what Senator Mikowski said in the beginning of the, um, uh, I just wanna quote that because she said, if we want to make a difference, it has to be long-term and it has to be bipartisan. And we truly believe that. We're, we're in a new day. I mean, it is so striking to see the dramatic difference that this new administration has enacted even in its first less than a month. Um, from the executive order to re-enter the Paris Climate Accord, which will take effect this coming week, um, to the executive orders to deal with regulations, to executive orders, as I mentioned about withdrawing support for the war, for, for funding Saudi Arabia and the UAE. These are all really important, but the fact is they alone are completely insufficient for what needs to happen. It is absolutely essential that Congress act on climate change and act on the vital issues that are going to make a true difference. So that's, that is really, really important. Um, one of the other things that we do is that in addition to really working with grassroots people all across the country and encourage them to build relationships with their members of Congress to really get to know those congressional offices so that the congressional offices will be responsive back and forth. We also really focus on grass tops, people who have either the relationship or the time and energy to really go deep and constant um, and work with them. And like you all, we are working to get letters to the editor published, working to have visibility in our local communities. It makes a difference. It is just, it, there's no question about it. You, you hear this from members of Congress, you read it in the Congressional Management Foundation's assessment of what works in Congress. So uh, I just want to underscore it not that you necessarily need my encouragement, but keep doing what you're doing. So let me talk just for a minute about being a faith-based organization, because that's important to us. Um, as Jamie said, we are a Quaker organization, and uh, we work with Quakers, and but we work with other people as well. But a lot of our coalition partners actually are within the faith-based community. There is a it's a group in Washington called the Washington Interfaith Staff Coalition, and they have different working groups. And so we're working with the climate change working group in that in that in that uh, realm. Um, but it is often because of our faith perspective that we come to this work. FCNL's vision is this: we seek a world free of war and the threat of war. We seek a society with equity and justice for all. We seek a community in which every person's potential may be fulfilled. We seek an earth restored. And it is the earth restored that is um, deep within our hearts. <laughs> it's deep within the call to what God wants for us. It's deep within the sense of what God created the earth for. It, it wasn't to destroy, uh, it was to um, be bountiful and be a place for all of us to enjoy, not just today, but for generations to come. And that's the plea that we're also hearing from uh, young people, even children. What are you doing for this planet? Um, I will tell you that five years ago when the Pope uh, came to the United States and he was in Washington DC and um, uh, I think in New York as well, it was such a moment of unity in Washington DC to have him speak about the beautiful encyclical that they had just issued called Laudato Si. And while I've never been a Roman Catholic, I felt a very deep identity with that uh, document uh, as one that is extremely powerful. Um, at FCNL, we actually develop our policy statement um, with some language that you can see it on our website. If you go to governance, you can read our policy statement. You can also read about our priorities. Um, but for many friends, and there are many who are actually part of CCL and who may be on the call today, um, this issue is the global imperative. This is the most um, urgent issue that we must work on. And uh, friends, Quakers have many, many issues they care about deeply. So just to say that this is, we are, we are in unity with you on that as well. Finally, let me just say a little bit about, about our climate change work. Um, we have been pursuing, as uh, Jamie indicated, um, uh, bipartisan support for putting a price on carbon. That has been work we've done for many years. And uh, I'd say six years ago, it was even hard to have the conversation in some Republican offices. I mean, you, you know, just you, it was just hard to talk about climate change. And you've helped make that make a difference. I mean. You know, even Senator Whitehouse uh, announced just a, a few weeks ago uh, what a difference you know it is for him, who has consistently and persistently worked to make big, big change. Um, 
I am hopeful, uh, uh, completely hopeful along with all of you that we will see some dramatic changes this year. I don't know exactly what it will look like. We have been uh, tracking um, the climate change legislation, uh, specifically the price on carbon. And one of the things that FCNL has done about a year and a half ago, we developed carbon pricing principles, which not surprisingly probably align with a lot of what you talk about, which of course are assuring a high enough price, assuring the issue of uh, transparency and, and uh, preventing leakage and assuring that the people who are vulnerable, people who are uh, uh, could be harmed are not harmed by this. And I'll just add one other sort of focus that's really developed for us. And this is really through a shared group that Mark and I have participated in, which is to really begin to understand how a price on carbon connects to environmental justice. Many people have been, I'm sure people at CCL and others have been engaged in environmental justice. There's been work on it that often is very community specific, but I feel like we've really learned by being in dialogue with um, environmental justice leaders, what a dramatic uh, impact it could be if we don't name this and, and, make, and assure that it is part of whatever we do about a price on carbon. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to be part of that conversation and, and look forward to see what we could do. Um, I think I'm going to pause there and just ask if there's, you know, Mark or Jamie want to come in and, and happy to, to uh, answer some questions. It's hard to follow what's going in the chat. So yeah, no, 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 that's Flannery's job. So Flannery's going to, going to come back to us in just a second with a, with the main themes we're seeing in the chat. Uh, I, I do want to say that there's a couple places that we've been working together for quite a while. One was the Climate Solutions Caucus and then putting a price on carbon. But if people haven't gone to uh, the Friends website, uh, you should do that. Um, you'll see events like Fierce Love. Really? <laughs> Somebody has an event called Fierce Love. And then also I love how they describe lobbying because they talk about uh, lobbying for change, but planting seeds for change in the future. Um, I just I find that such a breathtaking approach. Uh, but let me uh, just ch check and see with Flannery what kind of questions we're getting uh, as themes from the people out there. Um, we have one question uh, about FCNL's endorsement of various carbon pricing bills. And this person says, it's my understanding that FCNL uh, is not endorsing a particular carbon pricing bill because you guys are acting more as uh, sort of mediators between groups. So they're uh, wondering if you could just speak to that, uh, that choice. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, so we're waiting to see what happens in this Congress, of course, you know, where these bills are, you know, starting to surface and I don't think anything's been officially introduced yet, but uh, we expect that we're going to see a lot of legislation like the legislation that came in the last Congress. Um, we have tried to uh, make sure that whatever we do, we're applying the principles. And so we, we were particularly interested in the Coons Panetta bill. Um, but we also have tried to stay open to whatever bills will help advance using and, and testing those bills against these principles that I outlined. And Mark, thanks for the uh, endorsement of the website. I would say that you know if you go and just do a search at, on our website, um, you will find both the carbon pricing principles and then if you do a carbon legislation comparison or something like that, you'll find a look at each of the bills and an effort to try to do a comparative across them. Um, that has been the role we've played. I think, you know, we, this is a, this is a different era. I think we may be ready to um, lean in a little bit more on a specific uh, initiative, but we're waiting to see what gets introduced. Um, we will be motivating people at this point. Our legislative ask on this issue is um, simply to, to, to talk to your members of Congress about putting a price on carbon. And so um, eventually I think we're going to get much more into this, the weeds on this and the policy perspective, but um, until we begin to see what else rolls out, um, we'll, we'll be pressing forward um, to to have to have broad support and 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 faith based support to have people of faith. And I think we also can play a role with our colleagues in the faith community. They, a lot of work, a lot of um, churches have leadership that are that is focused on this, uh, but maybe less focused at the specific level. So I think uh, our lobbyists can help with that as well. And, and just to add to what Diane said about the assessment of bills, our Vice President of Government Affairs, Danny Richter, says that's the best resource you can get out there. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a great comparison of the different legislative uh, options. Flannery, what else are we seeing? Uh, we have a lot of questions about uh, environmental justice. Um, so could you maybe just expand a little more on, uh, on FCNL's work with environmental justice communities? And uh, specifically, this group is wondering about your sense of 
uh, e the EJ community's openness to carbon pricing, if carbon pricing really addresses equity enough, things like that? Sure, yeah. I I'll offer it a comment. And I really, I, you know, Mark probably has something to say about this too, because we've been participating in this group that has, I think, uh, schooled us a bit, but also opened up the question for how how do you, you know, set uh, priorities? And I, I will say that SNL hasn't done a lot. I mean, we are not working locally in the sense uh, we are building support for grassroots advocacy locally, but we don't actually do service work or, you know, do any work indirect directly in communities. And so um, in the sense that, you know, there are communities that have had um, really struggled with, you know, the crisis of, of, uh, of um, pollution, the crisis of degradation in their local communities. Um, we have not necessarily lobbied for that. And, that, and sometimes that's been a state or local issue, and sometimes it's been a federal issue. So I think partly what we're looking at is how do we assure that whatever we do um, on the price on carbon does no harm to communities that have been marginalized often, particularly Black and Brown communities and Native American communities. And that's been you know huge issue around you know nuclear weapons production for example and so um, I think those are the, the the issues that are really important to assure that we're looking at whatever leg legislation comes through with a lens that says what is the impact on of this on mar on on communities that have often been marginalized and that's not necessarily for me to decide or you know that's going to be a, 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 a situation where we need we need people who um, who are uh, black leaders in environmental justice helping guide us in this area. Yeah, and Flannery, I'll just add one thing. So Diane and I have been in this extraordinary process for two years of going to a retreat every couple of months. And um, I, I just have to say the leaders from the EJ world, like their generosity, you know, because a lot of their communities don't want to talk about a market-based solution, but they say, let's sit down and, and talk about one. And so we've been going through this incredibly slow process, but it, it's the speed at which it has to happen because we've, di we've discovered, I believe, this really deep trust of each other. Uh, but it, it's, uh, I believe that that's the pace that we had to work so that we could find common ways to, to deal with the problem. What else do you think, Flannery? Um, we have a few questions on the topic of bipartisanship. Um, so folks are wondering, what's your sense of the, the bipartisan climate possibilities in our current atmosphere, given that, uh, that impeachment is going on, soon we'll be in sort of a post-impeachment uh, world. Um, and one person has specifically asked about your sense of climate policies that Mitch McConnell might support, which is the, the million dollar question, but we'll just uh, open that up for your thoughts. Thank you. Um, well, I think there's a I think there's a deep hunger for bipartisanship, uh, not not by all 435 members, but I think there are in the House. But I think there is a sufficient group that that would like to see um, some cooperation. And I think certainly in the Senate we're seeing that. Um, you know, I've, I've one of our lobbyists was in the Sen Senator Murkowski's office this week and heard that expressed. Not 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 with her, but with her staff, just about how. And you know, obviously, it's, she's someone that we've all worked with a bit. But I think there is a profound desire to um, to um, a, I mean, well, there's a profound desire to snap back from the last four years, just to say that you know there's a real need. But I think there's also a recognition that getting to where we were four years ago is completely insufficient. That we have to we have to make change. And you know, Congress continues to have a pretty low approval rating, uh, and I think partly because they they haven't been bold and brave enough. And so some of what we need to do is provide courage. And what you're doing as advocates around the country is providing the political space for, for members of Congress to take courageous action. And we have to consistently push them to do that. Um, I, I don't feel like I have any comment on Senator McConnell. I, it is, he's not someone we've directly lobbied on this. So you you all, particularly the folks in Kentucky, may have a better read on that than, than we do. But uh, yeah, I think I think that's gonna. I think he's gonna have to be pushed by those in his caucus who say it's time to do something, and and um, on our, and who could who could you know go to the other side if if the Republicans aren't willing to do anything. Yeah, that's really been our approach. Also, is to try and approach the senators, particularly who are up for re-election in the next cycle, who we think they could push him. Um, I would love to think that we could push him directly, but I just don't think that's realistic. <laughs> Flannery, I think we have time for one more. Is there another one that jumps out at you? Yeah, we have some questions about um, how your your faith informs your advocacy, just 
personally. Um, and then also, if you have any advice for any advice for approaching other faith-based organizations to engage mm -hmm. in this work. Sure. Um, so uh, Mark noted a, a couple of the things that are on our website, but one of the uh, um, one of the um, kind of um, bumper stickers. It's really a bumper sticker, but it's also a mantra uh, that we've come up with is love thy neighbor, no exceptions. And of course, that's from the Bible to love thy neighbor as thyself and um, the golden rule. And um, when we first came up with that idea, it was, it was at a time when there was such partisanship, you know, and one of my colleagues said, yeah, we're going to put this big, we, uh, by the way, our, our office building is directly across the street from the Senate, uh, Heart Senate office building. We have a great location. Um, and so we put posters up, you know, like built like a billboard, small billboard up on our, the walls of our outside buildings, uh, outside of our building. When the Pope came, we said, welcome Pope Francis. So we had that up. But we've had it for a long time. Love thy neighbor, no exceptions. But one of my colleagues said, yeah, we want to put up this bump. We want to put up this sign. And we wanted to say, love thy neighbor. That means you Congress. And I said, you know, I'm thinking that that may not go over as well as like just recognizing that this is something we all have to do. And so you know, as friends, uh, we talk about seeing that of God in every person. And if we are seeing that of God in every person, if we approach every person as if they want to be their best and they could do their best, that is, a, that is an approach that is, um, is listening and attentive and um, willingness to uh, hold out both hope and love. And I know that seems odd when we think of political work, but it is something we all want. I mean, we all yearn for that kind of acceptance and attention and willingness. And um, I'm convinced that it, it opens doors. I'm convinced that it, um, it, it, it allows dialogue to happen. And when we can walk in those doors with um, clear um, persuasive statements and, and our own stories, our own stories of why this matters so much to us, um, we are going to get heard. We are going to make change here. And it's not just us at FCNL or CCL. I think we're both great organizations. It is, uh, there are legions, uh, legions behind us and with us. And so I am, I am extremely hopeful. And I think that's, I think that's a really important attitude to have, particularly on this issue, but on all of these issues, which are thorny, because uh, we are up against immense uh, challenge. Wow, <clears throat> thank you so much, Diane. Um, that was absolutely lovely and, and what I'd hoped for. So I appreciate that very, very much. You. Um, you're welcome to stay on for the next 10 minutes if you want. We have a few things that we have to do. It, it is a Saturday uh, and you know, we're all busy and spending a lot of time on Zoom lately. So. Well, I may listen in, but I'm gonna cut my video and my sound and just okay. thank you all for joining today and lovely to be with you. Great, thank you so much. Bye. So I want to read a tribute from uh, Peter Joseph uh, that he wrote about Secretary Schultz. Um, I feel really lucky. I, it's, it's kind of like a pinch me thing that I got to sit down across the desk from Secretary of State Schultz twice. And Peter Joseph is the one who recruited uh, Secretary Schultz and actually many members of our um, advisory board. And so uh, this is what he wrote. On April 7th, 2013, the Wall Street Journal published a commentary by George P. Schultz and Gary S. Becker titled, why we support a revenue neutral carbon tax. Coming from a former treasury sector secretary and a Nobel laureate in economics, their sage advice in the Wall Street Journal was a gift wrapped endorsement of CCL's proposal and an entree to the conservative CCL was courting at a time when it was fashionable to deny that global warming was even a problem. I'd been a CCL member for a year and a half when I saw the essay and thought what an I, that, that an icon of Schultz's stature endorsing CCL's proposal would open doors in DC, but how to approach him. My wife and I had a travel friend in Oakland, a kitchen designer who had helped his wife Charlotte remodel their kitchen. When she offered to make an introduction, I leapt at the chance. He accepted. On November 26, 2013, Mark flew up from San Diego. I picked him up at San Francisco airport at 8 a.m. for our 10 a.m. meeting on the Stanford campus, plenty of time. But we hit a solid wall of southbound traffic and crawled most of the way to Palo Alto, sweating and maybe even swearing a little. You don't arrive late for a meeting with the former Secretary of State, Treasury and Labor and Director of the Council of Economic Advisors under three presidents. Arriving breathless at 9.59, we were ushered into his wood paneled boardroom festooned with memorabilia from a lifetime of service, dancing with Ginger Rogers. She said, I dance better than Fred Astaire. 
conversing with the Pope and Margaret Thatcher, facilitating Jews immigrating out of the Soviet Union, facing off with Gaddafi, photos of his idol, Ronald Reagan, and of course, his many offspring. At precisely 10 a.m., Schultz walked in, dapperly dressed, and sat in his chair in the middle of a long conference table flanked by his associates. We made our pitch. He said he'd think about it. As we were leaving, he said in his gravelly voice, I really like what you're doing. It's good to see people actually doing something rather than just talking about it. A few months passed without a word, so I requested another meeting. Mark again flew up on May 6, 2014. We chatted about CCL, climate change, and politics for about half an hour, and I again popped the question, will you join our advisory board? Yes. Do I need this in writing? No, my word is good, I'm always on the record. Thus began a fruitful relationship. At our meetings over the following years, I brought along other CCLers for rich conversations. He was always gracious, prompt, professional, attentive, warm, and full of stories. Never say you'll do something unless you intend to do it. Don't point your weapon at anyone you don't intend to kill. Once a Marine, always a Marine. His presence on the advisory board attracted others of his caliber and proved provided cover for willing Republicans. He and former Secretary of State James Baker became the leads of Grass Tops Climate Leadership Council. He made the conservative case for a carbon tax in simple English. It's not a tax if the government doesn't keep the money, became a CCL mantra. When, other, when, he, when asked whether he favored 100% revenue return, he's clenched his fist and proclaimed, full dividend for political reasons, it's accountable. George Schultz actually helped save the world four times. As a young Marine, he saw death in the Pacific fighting the Axis powers. He helped, helped end the Cold War, maybe preventing World War III. He helped negotiate the Montreal Protocol, which curtailed CFCs from further destroying the ozone layer. And in his ninth decade, he took on climate change using his life, experience, gravitas, and plain talking persuasiveness. What do you mean you don't believe in climate change? We've got a new ocean in the Arctic. Just before his 97th birthday, I paid Secretary Schultz another visit. Having checked for this trusty assistant what he likes to drink, I bought the best bottle of bourbon I could find. When the guy at the high-end liquor store found out who it was for, he threw in a couple of his best Cuban cigars, telling him I'm a big fan. May his life works continue to inspire his CCL fans, and thank you, George Schultz, for your lifetime of service. Peter Joseph, thank you so much for that. Um, I would say that the... Um, the picture on the left is the first picture we were there. And then the picture on the right is the second picture. And then Brett, I think we have the picture with the bourbon bottle also. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> the second time when he said yes, he would be on our advisory board, Peter and I absolutely floated to his, his car. Uh, what a great, uh, a great human being that will be missed greatly. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you over the next couple of weekends. Next weekend, I will be joining the Northeast Appalachia Third Coast Tornadoes Conference. You know, there are certainly the challenges that come with um, being in a Zoom world, but it allows us to combine four regional conferences that we used, usually used to have to tra travel to individually. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of you next Saturday. And then the following Saturday, we used to do a Northern California, a separate California conference. We're doing one big call conference. So I hope to see many of you at both of those. And I appreciate both conference organizers for the invitation to, to join you. I want to just point to three things that happened since last month's call. One that was on the video before uh, we started, which is we now have a youth website. So for Sharon, for Destiny, for our IT and marketing department, thank you for having a resource now that is just up there for our um, uh, youth. Also, in one week in January, we got 39 endorsements, one. So uh, Diane talked about both a grassroots and a grass tops um, outreach effort. Uh, that was fantastic, that just in one week. So you, the work you're doing to continue to get influencers, both businesses and members of your community that are important to speak out, uh, is, is going quite well. And then last year, we had 648 op-eds. Um, it's been a little bit of a challenge, and that's why we're going we're gonna to push hard this month for letters to the editor, given the newspapers are dedicating less space. But to have 648 op-eds is absolutely extraordinary. We started off the first of this year also very strong with additional 37 op-eds. So I want to just thank you for the, 
great job you've done of creating a relationship where your local newspapers trust you. They know that you, that you'll give them quality information that makes the newspaper proud to, um, to, to publish that. So good work on those three levels. So what are we doing this month? The first thing we're gonna do is focus on letters to the editor. And I hope that you can go out and have a lot of fun with this. This is one of the easiest ways for new people to have something happen and make progress. One of the things that I used to do when interns could come to the office is when a new intern would come in after we'd worked together for about a week, we would sit down and draft a letter to the editor together. And um, I just loved how exciting it was that they would share that with their family after they got published. So I think this is an easy way for us to get early wins with new people. And also, you know, right now, we used to be able to go to targeted districts and send out Facebook ads. We can't do that right now. So in a certain sense, this is like free advertising. We're getting a lot of exposure for no cost. I also think it's a good opportunity for you to work together, to have writing parties, to coach new people, to, you know, get together so that it's, a, it's an occasion not just to get uh, pieces in your paper, but also is a chance for you to work together which is what our second action is about. This is about outreach. You know, every Wednesday, we still have a, an introduction call. Um, please make sure you're inviting people to that. Uh, we're having a special um, climate advocate training for the people that are new to your chapter. So that is available. Uh, we'll be doing special training for our March lobbying and now Earth Day is coming out. So please make sure you're reaching out to the other groups in your community, looking to see events that we could host together if we don't host them together. Uh, let's go ahead and host one ourselves so that we're using Earth Day as a big outreach opportunity. Also on President's Day, we're doing a tweet storm. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't signed up for, for uh, Twitter, you'll notice on the action, one of the, action sheet, one of the things that reminds you is it's free. Uh, and I know some people think that um, that short of message just seems crazy. How can you commute anything? But it is where so much of the public discourse happens now. So it's important that we are weighing in and we're going to have a tweet storm on Monday on President's Day. So if you can do that, please do um, reach out. Okay, we have a message from um, Senator Coons that he filmed for our Mid-Atlantic Regional Conference. And Brett, could you share that with everybody now? Hi, I'm U.S. Senator Chris Coons from Delaware. Happy New Year. I am optimistic that 2021 will be a time that we come together as a nation, heal, and take meaningful action on climate. So I want to thank the Citizens Climate Lobby for your important work pushing all of us as elected officials to address climate change. I want to thank Delaware CCL members in particular for your productive and enthusiastic engagement, both here in our home state and nationally. Delaware, as you know, is the lowest lying state we already see the consequences of climate change and severe weather events, eroding coastlines and soaring flood insurance prices. Addressing climate is an urgent priority for President Biden and the new Democratic majority leaders in the Senate and the House. Last month, Congress passed a big bipartisan energy package that included five bills that I wrote and worked on that will support energy innovation and energy efficiency. The Senate Climate Solutions Caucus, which I founded in co-chair, is working tirelessly to support energy innovation, agricultural and natural solutions to climate change, and to educate a broad bipartisan group of senators on the urgency of carbon pricing. As I have in the last two Congresses with my Climate Action Rebate Act and the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, I will be introducing legislation in this Congress around carbon pricing. We've taken steps in the right direction, but there's so much more we need to do. We need your help and we can't wait. Your engagement plays a critical role in educating and engaging other citizens, my more reluctant colleagues, and in building the political space for us to make real change in addressing climate. As we move into a year where the world will once again gather in Glasgow, Scotland for COP26, I am excited about the prospects for real progress on addressing climate change. You're an essential part of it, and I am so grateful for all the work you have done, are doing, and will do, and for the change we'll make together. Thank you. Thank you for that. So the last thing I'll mention is our guest speaker for next month is a climate scientist by the name of Jennifer Burney. Jennifer works at the confluence of food security and climate change. And uh, she was the first person who was uh, named the chair of a new position um, at UC San Diego that was named for our founder, Marshall Saunders. So it is the Marshall Saunders. Whew.
chancellors and down chair in global climate policy and research. So we're excited to have her on and we're really uh, appreciative that uh, Joan and Irma Jacobs would endow a chair in Marshall's name at UC San Diego. So thank you so much again, Diane Randall. What an amazing guest you were to have and thank you all for being here today. We'll see you all next month. Thanks everybody. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.